All right, we're recording. Okay, great. So hello, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Bryn Hare. I'm the executive director of uh, the Cannabis Control Board. Um, and I'm about to introduce our very special guest um, in just a moment. Um, but I first wanted to welcome everyone to another session of our social equity networking event series. And this is a series of events that the Canvas Control Board hosts in order to give uh, licensees and potential licensees the opportunity to connect with each other and share knowledge and hear from some industry professionals um, on a variety of topics that are um, sort of topics of the day, topics of particular interest. <clears throat> so because it's uh, March 16th and clearly it's just about time to get started with our planting, um, today, <laughs> we're going to be talking about cultivation technical assistance. Um, and as Nellie mentioned at the beginning, these uh, sessions are recorded, also live streamed, so um, they can be accessed later for folks. <clears throat> and yes, the chat is open for anyone who has questions. <clears throat> Sorry, I've been talking too much today. Okay, so I would like to welcome um, one of the Canvas Control Board's um, compliance agents. Chris Matika, she is a certified um, horticulturist in the state of Vermont and <clears throat> has also been on the faculty of the horticulture and agriculture department at Vermont Technical College, where she taught cannabis cultivation and processing courses among lots of other things. Um, Chris also is an instructor for, is an instructor for Castleton University's Cannabis Studies Certificate Program. Um, Chris has uh, years, many years of um, familiarity with the cannabis plant, is an absolute wealth of knowledge and an incredible resource, and the board is really lucky to have her. Um, so I'm very excited <laughs> for, I'm particularly excited about today's um, net, our networking session, just because I love anytime Chris uh, gives me a lecture. I could listen to her lectures all day long. So um, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Chris. I will just note that at the end of the session, there will be lots of time left for um, people to share their own stories, their own thoughts, ask questions, um, and et cetera. So thanks, everybody, for coming. And I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thank you. Great. Um, so um, for one, I just wanted to say how exciting it is to have a audience for today's topic, which is pest and disease. And as much as I am so excited about this topic, sometimes I don't have people to sit and listen to it. So it's <laughs> wonderful to have you all here today. Um, so I'm going to, to plug in here so you can see this presentation. Um, when I get going, I'm not really gonna pay attention to the chat, um, but just, feel free to throw things in the chat and then we'll um, look at that at the end um, and answer any questions. So I'm just gonna just kind of motor through, um, but we'll have plenty of time at the end for, for questions on this topic or really any cultivation topic, I'll do my best. Um, so is this where yeah. I plug in? Yep, should fit on that side. Oh, that was depressing. Sometimes it just takes a moment. So. Oh, great. Okay. So here we are, my favorite topic, <laughs> protecting your crop from pest and disease. Um, so Responsible pest and disease management. Um, this is such a cornerstone piece of cultivation. It's it's something you never can ignore. It's really always there. Um, and good management can help protect the consumer, of course, because pests overreacting to pest and disease can do more harm than good sometimes. Um, it protects the integrity of our industry to have a well-managed cultivation um, portion of the industry. It protects your brand uh, from both scrutiny by retailers um, on the powdery mildew front 
um, and any issues with pesticides, of course. And it protects your bottom line to have good management um, because protecting the crop from pests and disease can be really expensive, both in products themselves to fight pests and disease and labor and emotional pain. <laughs> Um, so as everyone knows, no amount of pests and disease pressure is worth using residual pesticides. However, when you get into a situation where there's a, there's an issue and it's, it's obviously affecting your crop and it, 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 you can easily panic. So having, um, a really good understanding of where the tools are and what safe tools, um, wh where the list is to, to go to is something that we're definitely gonna cover today. Because when you're faced with a problem is the worst time to make a decision about what you're gonna do for it. You, you need to have those things in place before. Um, every environment is different. You all, you all are the only people who are really the, the um, the gods of your kingdom as far as the your environment. No one else's solution is necessarily a silver bullet for you. So just always take advice um, with a grain of salt um, and try different things. You know your environment best. Uh, pest and disease battle, it requires constant vigilance. It, it'll never be over, not ever. So settle in for a long relationship with management. <laughs> and um, it's, it, it isn't all bad. It isn't all bad. There's, you can really um, win this war, but it takes um, some really good best practices um, will, will really help here. Um, a couple of things that I wanted to mention um, about this constant battle. It is good to remember that we're working with monocultures, basically. You're, if you're growing inside or you're growing outside, you have one plant concentrated in an area. And it's a resource for certain pests and disease. And so that concentrated monoculture can build up pest pressure. Um, and you, there's a lot of life out there that wants to make use of the resource that is your crop, both funguses and insects. So um, really being aware that, that there's a life out there that, that wants to consume your, your crop, um, and that's always going to be an issue. Good sanitation procedures are the cheapest and most effective pest management method. I think everyone knows this, at least in theory, um, but when things get really busy, it's hard to necessarily have time to go back and think through some really good SOPs, standard operating procedures for sanitation. You just kind of get swept along and you do what you can do. But um, having a good sanitation just routine in place is worth its weight in gold. A couple of other best practices, seeds are cleaner than leaves always. So folks that are starting from seed are gonna be in a much better position to exclude pests and may often be, you know, have runs that they never see any pressure whatsoever. Leaves, as in buying clones in or having your own stock plants that you take clones from, are for the most part more problematic in that there's just more opportunity for pests and disease to get a, a foothold. Um, assume if you're buying any plants, um, any clones or seedlings, that you could have an issue. If you make that assumption, even if it's your best friend in the world, and she says they are clean, there's nothing on these. It's just foolish to make that assumption. You really open yourself up to possibilities of getting whatever issues maybe that the other grower doesn't even know about into your 
pristine environment. So um, be sure that you have quarantine space if you are buying in plant material that is set aside. So this might be a nice little grow rack someplace that is set aside from your grow areas um, that you can put those plants under light so they don't go downhill and observe them and treat them before you bring them into your, again, your beautiful, pristine grow uh, and, and then bring in all those problems. So treating them just as a matter of fact and scouting those plants before your introduction, it would be a, a good part of, a, of that good sanitation procedure um, best practices. And there's lots of good techniques um, to do that. You could, you know, if you have kind of a standard go-to oil, um, you know, like some of those botanical oils, that might be a good place to start. You know, rosemary oil, port oil, um, for, a, for an initial treatment, just be careful because seedlings can be, you know, a little sensitive, um, smaller plants. And then, just make sure you're scouting them, which is to say taking under magnification like a hand lens and looking at those plants, turning them around, looking under the leaves, really taking a good hard look at them uh, before you introduce them. It doesn't mean that you can see every problem, but to not look at them at all and just stick them in your grow room is just being pretty brave. Um, and then keeping records. So records, um, these are records that are required for compliance anyway, but application logs. So this would be any time you're applying any materials whatsoever, um, and even beneficial insects, any pest and disease management applications should be recorded in a log. And the easiest way to do this is either having like a notebook, um, where you're that you go to every time you apply and put the you know the time that you applied the material you applied what you applied it for what room you applied it to um, or what area of your field and then um, you a lot of people just have this little log sticking to the wall outside their room that can be another really quick and easy way to make um, recording this data just part of the, your routine. And then weekly scouting. This is a whole other talk in itself, this scouting and monitoring. And I would happily go on for hours about just this topic, but paying attention to your plants, not just looking at the beautiful flower, but having magnification like a hand lens um, and running around your grow inside or outside and turning over leaves, getting down into the canopy. Um, some of this monitoring could be done by just grabbing a whole bunch of fan leaves from a room and then taking it back and sitting down with magnification and to seeing if you see any signs of um, mites, of aphids, any other insect infestation, damage from things like thrips, even if the thrips aren't there, you can still see the, the scars that they leave, and of course, any of the um, fungal diseases. So again, this is this whole monitoring piece is a whole talk in itself, but um, there are you know resources online where you can look at plant monitoring. This is not cannabis specific stuff. This is general, good best practices with any plant um, cultivation. Sticky cards, I did want to mention that here. Um, sticky cards are those yellow sticky cards. Many people may have seen these. Um, they are put up into rooms and they, they're best used as monitoring, not as a pest prevention in themselves because you'd have to put up a heck of a lot of sticky cards to actually affect the populations that you're trying, you know, knock down the populations. But these little yellow sticky cards put up like, you could just put one every thousand square foot. So it could be one in a flower room, centrally placed, you know, somewhere above the canopy 
those are going to collect any flying insects. So they won't necessarily show you if you have spider mites. They will collect fungus gnats. They will collect thrips. They will collect flying aphids. They will collect white fly. Um, so they can be useful for, for getting a jump on some flying insects um, that you didn't otherwise know were there. Um, all of this, this technique that I'm talking about is uh, part of what's called IPM or integrated pest management. Um, so this is a management system that is um, really gaining a foothold in, in the plant world. So all horticulture, agriculture um, uses this integrated management approach. Um, and basically, it uses multiple strategies to control pests and disease. And that would be compared to the old system of doing pest and disease management on, again, on any plants where you just sprayed. You just sprayed and sprayed and sprayed. You sprayed if there were pests, you sprayed if there weren't pests, you just threw product at the plants. Um, integrated pest management is a much better system because you're looking to control pests and disease, but you're balancing the cost of application versus the economic cost of the damage. So there might be a situation where you could have a small outbreak of say spider mite in the corner of a room. Maybe it's really hot and dry in one little corner and you have a little outbreak there. And you don't notice it until you're a week from harvest and it's pretty, you know, pretty minimal. There's no point in in throwing a lot of, of weaponry at that at that moment. You have to think about what is the cost, what's the, the damage to your your crop at that moment. Um, and maybe that's something, you know, once you hang that and dry that, that's not going to be an issue. Maybe the pest just goes away in that tiny little bit, or maybe Maybe you try to apply something just in that corner, but you're not going to just, you know, apply something to the whole room. Of course, not that lat latent flower. So what I'm trying to get at is maybe zero tolerance just isn't economically feasible. And in some of the insect pests, we aren't talking the same type of damage and pressure that, say, powdery mildew. Um, as a pest could be for a grower. So so really weigh the, you know, make it a business decision when you're looking at pest and disease. And consider the at integrated pest management. So it considers those economic questions and also the impact to the environment. Um, so control strategies that integrated pest management looks at is sanitation, like I said, um, an, an, um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of, what's the other word? Here. Cure. <laughs> a little late in the evening. Uh, so uh, sanitation, of course, is the, the cornerstone to integrated pest management. Um, environmental and cultural best practices, so just good um, plant cultivation, scouting and record keeping are parts of this, this approach, and the use of um, BCAs, biological control agents, which we'll talk more about. So exciting, using life to um, help us in the fight against pest and disease, so cool. <clears throat> and in integrated pest management, um, chemical control is used as a last resort. And not as a Hail Mary, it's used when it's appropriate. And sometimes, depends on the past, that can be early in the um, outbreak, but it's not the go-to in this, again, integrated pest management approach. Integrated pest management is another whole hour's worth of um, lecture for sure. Okay. Pesticides, the problem and the solution. First, I want to call out this word pesticide. Um, the term pesticide 
is not a bad word. Pesticides are anything that you use to, um, uh, you know, try to manage pest and disease. Organics, botanically derived, all of those are technically considered pesticides. So when we talk about pesticides, I say that in with a neutral tone, they aren't necessarily bad just because they're pesticides, but we do have a bad list in this program and we do have a good list. Um, so the bad list, it's right on your COA, your pesticide um, certificate of analysis, that list, those are, the li those are the bad pesticides that could fail you in this program. So those are active ingredients. If you don't know whether or not you're spraying a, a product that has those, just look on the, pro on the label, the active ingredient. If it's one of those chemicals or materials that is on that pesticide COA, you're, you're in trouble. That's, that's definitely going to be something that's going to be problematic. So um, you want to call your compliance agent if right now you're realizing you might have one of those and you want to check your, your um, pesticide arsenal that you have for those um, materials are, that are on your pesticide COA. And if you find anything, just call, call compliance. We can uh, definitely walk you through any issues there. On that bad list, it's the ingredients that are on there are residual or systemic. That means that they're going to stay with the tissues of the plant and your final consumer is more likely to come into contact with them. That's why they're on the list. Um, don't use these ingredients. The other thing that I want to mention is there are residual pesticides that are organically derived. Um, and I think I get to this later, but um, just because it's OMRI doesn't mean that you're safe. There are plenty of botanically derived pesticides that have real power and stay with the plant for quite a while, um, putting final consumers into contact with those pesticides. So the good list. It's the allowable active ingredient list. It's on our website um, under the guidance, pesticide guidance um, tab. So it provides a wide range of safe options. And I did wanna note that this good list should be a dynamic list. It's going to change as new options for control um, you know, come across our table and we can evaluate them. So if there's something that you are using or want to use um, that is not on the bad list, but it's also not on the good list, reach out to us because um, we do want to make that list really useful. And there's great things out there that we don't necess haven't necessarily looked at that could be really appropriate for our program. So don't feel that you're restricted to the good list. Um, and if you know if you if you have a material that you think is deserving of inclusion there, um, it would be great to, to reach out to compliance and we'll take a look at that and evaluate it and see if we can add to it because that good list is definitely going to change. Um, even on the good list, be cautious about applying anything to late flower stages. Um, there's plenty of things on the good list that could still um, maybe create flavors or, or aftertaste on your product um, or could do some damage to the product if applied late in flower. So always be careful. So here's the bad list, uh, most of it anyway. So I just wanted to note that um, these guys down here at the bottom of the list, pyrethrins and spinosin, both, both of these materials are can be found in some organically certified products. Um, and both of them will fail you if they're detected on your pesticide test. So, so be really careful. We run in, all of compliance runs in, into a lot of these um, OMRI certified products that contain pyrethrin or spinosin. Um, 
And even though pyrethrin is, again, it's botanically arrived, derived from, from chrysanthemums, it still packs a powerful punch. And the other thing to know about pyrethrin um, is besides that it's, it will fail you and it's, it's not safe for the final consumer to come into contact with in the many ways that we consume cannabis, it also will hang out in your grow and do a real damage to any uh, beneficial insects. So if you're using beneficial insects at all, um, if you have any pyrethrin in your environment, it can really knock back the efficacy of those expensive but wonderful uh, pest and disease management options. So that's another thing to consider. Um, and the other thing about the bad list, so these materials aren't designed for the many ways that cannabis is processed and consumed. And the one I really want to point out here is myclobutanil, which is the active ingredient in Eagle 20, which is a fungicide and it's used in, in many other crops, um, some even food crops, but its danger comes with, with um, smoking it because if it's um, ignited, that's when that chemical changes and um, converts to some, you know, some um, really bad chemicals that can really harm people. So just note that again, these weren't designed to be burned in some cases um, or concentrated in the many ways that we, you know, all these wonderful ways in which we um, create cannabis products. So that's another reason they're on the list. A good list. As great as this list is, um, it's, sometimes not easy to use just listed by active ingredients. So um, what we're going to do today is talk about kind of what's on here um, and what kind of tools those are. So this is alphabetical. Um, I'm not going to go through everything, but you'll get a good kind of idea of the type of tools we have um, on the good list. So here you have the active ingredient. These aren't brand names. These are just that active ingredient and it's located on the label of your product by law. And then we have product examples, but there's many, many more products out there um, that are on this, that have these as active ingredients. These example products aren't what we're encouraging. We're just, they're just examples. So you don't have to use these products over other products that have these active ingredients. I just wanted to point that out. And then pesticide type. Whoops. Um, we have um, herbicides, insecticides, miticides, fungicides, um, nematicides for nematodes, um, some um, plant growth regulators, because you have your um, rooting hormone on there as well. So those are kind of the classifications. And now um, let's go more deeply into what those tools are. So the ingredients are considered safe for consumers um, and they include biological pesticides. So these are these um, biological control agents that um, is what the IPM kind of calls them, bacteria, mycorrhizae, um, and similar organisms insecticidal fungus, so cool. Um, and then other things on that list, um, you'll find in products that are both 25B category pesticides, which are the safe, that, that the ingredients on those um, in the materials is deemed to be safe for humans and doesn't really need that much regulation. What I'm trying to say is, those active ingredients, you can find them in both EPA registered products and these 25B category products. Um, we would prefer if there's an option that you choose EPA registered products because they are better vetted, um, there's better support behind them. And some of the 25B category pesticides, 
like Dr. Zimes, which let me be clear, is totally fine and allowed. Um, but many of these 25B categories will have an active ingredient. And I believe um, this is from memory, but I think on Dr. Zimes, it's citric acid. And then they have inert ingredients. And many 25B category pesticides have really actually active ingredients. Um, and on the Dr. Zimes, there's some type of insecticidal soap that's listed as an inert ingredient. It's really should be listed as the active ingredient. All this to say that the EPA registered products are made to conform and are really, really transparent with what the, the ingredients on that are and they're better tested and vetted. Um, so in Massachusetts, they um, chose to only allow the, their regulated cannabis um, entities to use 25B red, uh, category pesticides because at the time the EPA hadn't registered um, very many materials with cannabis on the label. So there was a feeling, I, I know this is kind of background, but there was a feeling that the cannabis, uh, that it would be non-compliant or against the law to use EPA registered materials on cannabis. We're having none of that at all. We want you to use good quality ingredients, the active ingredients of which are on our list. And if you can find EPA registered products with those active ingredients, we would love it if you could choose those. But there's plenty of really good cate category, 25B category on materials out there. Um, Manufacturers can be good sources of information and support. You guys, you're legitimate now. You can call up the manufacturer and say, hey, I have a problem with such and such. Is there, do you have in, any information? And this is another plug for EPA registered stuff. Um, manufacturers like BioWorks, um, that I believe is the manufacturer of Botanigard, one of the you know, products on our list. They have a whole support system and they have a cannabis program and they have recommendations for how to apply these and what things to mix in a tank mix with some other products. Um, really good information. And, you know, please make use of those manufacturer uh, supports because you are legitimate commercial businesses. These things are expensive. Um, so you should take advantage of the supports offered. Um, okay, how to use this. So we're, I'm just gonna break this down very roughly into diseases and insects, but diseases and the common two, most common two diseases that we face in cannabis are powdery mildew and botrytis, which is also called gray mold or bud rot possible solutions on our list. And again, there's no silver bullet and um, things work for some people and don't work for others. So you got to work with your own environment. But bacillus species. So there's a bunch of different bacillus species that are options for um, fungicides. And these are biological control agents. They're live bacteria that you're putting on your plant that um, that can really help with, with um, fungal diseases. They're best if you apply them early and kind of lay down um, that material. And then the, the pathogen uh, spores have a really hard time finding real estate on the leaf to infect your plants. But many of the bacilluses have to be applied or kind of as a preventative or early in infection. Oils. I think oils are really some of the best materials you can be using. And these would be mineral oils like Cefoil X or any of the botanical oils, your geranium oils, your thyme oils, rosemary. Um, they do double duty and most of them are have a fungicidal effect and an insecticidal effect. So great materials. Um, potassium bicarbonate, which um, is Millstop is one of the brand names but it basically changes the pH of the surface of the leaf outside the range that is um, favorable for 
for powdery mildew, especially to live. And then the last one I want to add, uh, mention is the peroxides, um, zero tall, sanidate, um, Aragard, I think is another one. These um, peroxides are generally uh, hydrogen dioxide or hydrogen peroxides um, that also have um, a food grade acid. This is the product to have on hand. It, it, um, it will sanitize surfaces. You can apply it to your plants. And it's the 11th hour, you know, panic that last week with some, some uh, disease pressure. Those peroxides are the, are the, the um, product to go to. They will oxidize. Your final consumer will not come into contact with them. They should affect the taste zero. Um, so they're really, and they're really effective at oxidizing the uh, body of the funguses. So um, a good one to have in the stable. Insect pests, so common insect pests would be spider mites, aphids, or thrips. There are others, but those are kind of the biggies. Um, and possible solutions that are on our list, potassium salts of fatty acids. Those are all, those are the insecticidal soaps. So you, these are in products like Safer's insecticidal soap or Impede, um, but those are really generalist um, insecticides that are really effective against pretty much all the insects. They're best used in veg, only carefully early in flower because they can um, they can possibly affect taste but they're a really effective pesticide. As a Duractin, which is a neem-derived um, material, Azimax is a very common um, brand name. That's an option. It's actually an insect growth regulator, so it only affects, um, what it does is that it messes with the insect's ability to molt, so they can't get out of juvenile phases and they die. Um, so it can, it isn't as effective against adults or egg stages, um, but when used as a tank mix with Bovaria bassiana, the one right below it, uh, Botanigard, it can be much more effective. And Bovaria, I get so excited about this, but Bovaria <laughs> is that insecticidal fungus. So if you've watched any of like the blue planet or any of these things, they'll ha they you might have heard of these insecticidal funguses that in infect insects. And then the insects are sort of zombified and the fungus makes the insect crawl to the top of a blade of grass where it then dies. And then the fungus bursts out of the body of the insect in these weird, um, you know, mushroom, sporulating flowers and disseminates more fungus. That's what we're talking about here, this bassiana. Um, it's not as sexy as some other insecticidal funguses. You're not going to see weird stuff. It's just going to infect the insects and kill them out of sight. Are you um, sure you're not talking about cordyceps? What's From that? The Last of Us? Sorry. This is a... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds very familiar to those of us watching The Last of Us. Anyway. Those, yes inspired by <laughs> Bovaria bassiana. Now I know. Yeah, now you know. So um, anyway, it's a really, it's a really cool generalist insecticide um, and used with, with as a Duractin, again, which is limited in, in what lifestyle cy cycles that it affects, it can be really effective. Um, this can also be used in dips, like clone dips. Um, and Botanigard is from um, BioWorks, I think. Oh, I think I spelled it wrong too. It's without the G there, Botanigard. Um, but anyway, again, BioWorks is a great resource. So if you were interested in trying these things and you wanted to know more about how to use them in your system, that would be a good source. And again, back to the oils, both uh, fungicides and insecticides um, and citric acid. Um, is another effective one that might also have some fun, uh, fungicidal effect, um, but citric acid is also an insecticide. So that's not everything on our list, but what I wanted to point out is those are kind of the, 
the basic classes of tools that we have on the list. Um, and then a couple of products of note. Oh, see, Botanic Art again, so excited. <laughs> um, um, regalia. So regalia is um, contains an active ingredient from, I'm not going to try to say this, but it's a type of knotweed. And regalia, it, it's actually a biostimulant. What it does is it stimulates the plant's immune system. So plants will, um, when they're attacked by pest and disease, they're able to basically um, interpret signals that the attack is producing in the plant and it stimulates an immune, immune response that can be chemical. It can be making the tissues a little harder for the, for, and, and um, not as tasty to the insects. Um, it can be sort of chemical warfare when fighting the, um, you know, funguses. So generally, this immune system is not turned on until the plant is attacked. Regalia turns it on pre-attack. So the plant um, immune system is on. It's ready, you know, the chemical warfare is, is engaged and it does a better job fighting off pest and disease. Um, and this is, again, a, a lot of you guys are using Regalia. I, I'm really impressed with the, with the um, amount of use that it's getting, but it's a good good product to try. Again, it's better if you're, turning that plant immune system on early. So it's better sort of in a preventative program where you're applying it to vegetative st uh, stages. So, and then Botanigard, we kind of went over because I jumped the gun because I was so excited. But a good, a good thing to have. And again, there, not everyone has good experiences with all these things that I'm just so excited about. So the, you have to find the right materials that work with your environment and with your um, spray, uh, spray style. Okay, so beyond the good list, there are biological control agents that we've talked about, you know, uh, bacteria and in the insecticidal fungus. But then you have all the beneficial insects that aren't on our good list that are really great things to consider using. Um, and those beneficial insects are considered the standing army. So in many um, big commercial horticulture greenhouses, they do um, automatic and routine releases of certain beneficial insects, all depending on what pressure um, that particular grower is under. Historically, if they've had problems with aphids or spider mites at a certain time of year, they preemptively do releases of certain beneficial insects to fight those, those enemies um, before the populations of the enemy build up. So you have this standing army of good guys that's hungry in the crop waiting for the, the enemy to drop. Um, so that's the idea anyway. See how exciting and interesting um, pest and disease management can be? The battle itself is so fun. Um, so it requires good scouting and ID to use effectively. So you can spend a ton of money on these uh, beneficial insects. So you need to know that your environment is good for them and they're actually in the crop working. So again, weekly getting in and scouting and looking at things to see if you can see the, the enemy um, insect and also your, your new, your friends that you've purchased to hunt through the crop. Um, can be cost effective or costly depending on management. Beneficial insects can, it can be quite a bit of money or it can be just the cheapest way to, to effectively deal with a problem. It all depends on your, your specific situation. But the one thing that it's the best for is that you can load up your flower rooms so you, you don't have very many options for spray and late in flower. So those uh, beneficial insects, you, you could, that can really be the solution for that little spider mite problem in the corner is to be loading them up with um, predatory mites and not having to worry about spraying at all. 
Are you going to be zero pest free with beneficial insects? No, but they can keep them way under economic damage such that you don't have to worry about anyone, you know, seeing them really. And you don't have to spray and deal with spraying a, a late, you know, flower crop. The beneficial insects can just take care of that. And they're a lot easier and fun, more fun to apply than um, spraying. Takes a bit of research and practice to use effectively. You want to work with folks that you're getting the um, uh, beneficial insects from to, to make sure you're you're getting the right species. Um, they're perishable. So you need to really pay attention when the shipping date is because if they sit on your doorstep in either freezing cold or blazing hot um, days, you can lose your, your shipment. Usually when that happens, you can reach out to the supplier and if it only happens once or twice a year, they'll, they'll refund you and send a new shipment. So, you know, you do have a little bit of flexibility there with these suppliers. They're great. And it's so much more fun than pesticides. Okay, and then one example of this, I have no idea what our time is. You're at 5.45. Okay, good. Um, fungus gnats. So fungus gnats are, an, are the flying mosquito looking like insects that, um, that are really common to indoor production or greenhouse production. They reproduce in soil or media. Um, and their larvae feed on usually algae and in the soil, but if in large numbers, they actually can feed on roots and can be problematic for clones. The adults don't feed, but they will just stick to flower. And if you have high numbers, you can actually have quite a bit of insects stuck to your flower. So you really kind of want to manage this one. Um, if you're Trying to deal with this, it's it's a it's a tricky one, but the go-to has been this Steiner Nema Feltier, and that's a beneficial nematode. And so you can buy these products, and basically this comes in like a little cake, kind of like tofu, like a tofu cake. And you need to um it needs to be under refrigeration um, to store them, but then you just mix them in your um Fertigation, you can run them right through irrigation into the crop. And if you do it weekly, it really can take care of your fungus gnat problem. Um, so, you know, you have to get the, the amount correct and you would work with a supplier to, to kind of get in how, how big a cake you need and how much of it you're going to throw in at a time to mix in. Um, but it can be a really effective uh, solution. And that's, again, another. Bio, BCA, biological control agent. It's alive, but it does a great job on fungus gnats. And they did a study with some really large uh, horticulture greenhouses that were trying to do, you know, they still had chemical control for fungus gnats. And they introduced um, Steiner Nema and the, the um, commercial greenhouses in the study were actually shocked because the Steiner Nema, and they had um, the beneficial nematodes along with some other chemical controls and the beneficial nematodes outperformed any other chemical um, um, products on the market in most of the greenhouses that were in this study. So this can be, it's not just fun because it's alive, it's actually you know, one of the more effective um, fungus gnat controls out there. So some of the brand names are Nemesis or Nematac. Okay. <laughs> wow. That was so fun. Uh, so you, you don't have to have questions about pest or disease management. Now you're free to have, you know, questions about any cultivation topic. But I did want to say, if any of you want to chime in, um, let's just think of this as sort of a, a round table. So as folks ask questions, um, some of you out there might have really good um, experience with the questions, so I would say feel free to join in on this conversation. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Well, yeah, let's let's open it up for questions in our last ten minutes. Um, and yes, because this is a networking session, everyone should feel free to share their own experience. <clears throat>
We have Tito up. Hi, Great. Go ahead, Tito. Yep. <clears throat> um, so, hi, guys. Uh, and Chris, that was great. I really enjoyed it. That was a good presentation. That was all really good advice. Um, and I didn't hear you talk about trichoderma. Is trichoderma okay? Yeah, trichodermas are on the list. And so okay. trichoderma, and, and I put them in that mycorrhizae sort of category of things in that they're, um, you know, beneficial soil organisms, but they can really, really, um, help with root rots and, and root health. What, what experience have you had with them, Tito? Um, I haven't used it yet, um, but um, they were talk talking about it on, on Tad Hussey and I was interested in a, in a product, I think it was called Root Shield. I think mm -hmm. is that what it was um, with trichoderma and um, it sounded really cool uh, because uh, I was fighting um, I was fighting mold issues in my in my small facility, and uh, it, I was really pushing VPD numbers. Um, and I, I definitely learned learned where the lines are for me. That's for sure. And uh, but then um, I had to get the the mold out of uh, my heat pumps. That's like the last spot where it was living, and and I and I didn't realize it. And then so I I, I was still dealing with the problem. And so at that point, I'm like, you know, I'm just diving deep into it, all things uh, mold, and especially since I'm growing living soil, like I, I, you know, the trichoderma seemed really intriguing to me that that could actually help attack it while it's in the soil where it naturally lives. Um, and so that's where I heard it. Has anyone else had, has anyone else used root shield? Um, my experience with root shield has been actually it was most helpful with poinsettias. So poinsettia com comes as cuttings, and they're um, historically really hard to root and have lots of root problems. So root shield was is this trichoderma again? It's this live organism, and you I would put it into um, a solution that I would dip the the clump, the rooted cuttings in before transplanting them. Mm -hmm. And it really, really helped with root health. So that's not as a soil think, drench, not as a soil drench. You can totally do it as a soil drench. That's just how okay. I used it was um, dipping rooted cuttings before I uh, potted them up, but as a soil drench as well. And, but mm -hmm. I would just say be really judicious. It's not some of these things um, you can, you can throw as many, you know, beneficial nematodes as you want. In, into a bucket and apply them without plant problems. But root shield, you really want to follow the directions on how much you put in, especially for rooted cuttings. But with the root, you know, drenches to larger containers, it's probably um, not as big a deal. Um, but yeah, they can really play with other beneficials and really have um, an effect, a good effect on root health for sure. Okay. Um. And then um, I also um, had a question. I I never had powdery mildew ever. I've, I still have never actually had it as a grower. And, awesome. Um, and so, but but you know, so my experience is very limited. And so uh, I I had a a cultivar offered back to me that I just could not resist. It's it's my absolute favorite one out of out of everything. And um, I I had to figure out a way. So I took a clone of it, and it had powdery mildew on it. The person said that uh, it didn't start with that plant. It started with a different cultivar in his room, but this clone was in there and got it. So I kept it in quarantine for four months in a somebody in a whole separate building, not where I am. Uh, and uh, then, uh, and I treated it with Pure Crop One. That's always my go-to spray. And the Pure Crop One took care of the powdery mildew on the clone really quickly in in one treatment. I I kept spraying it a few more times, but one treatment, it was gone. And then from that point on, for that next four months, I just tried to really tease it out. I was like, I want to see this. I want to see this powdery mildew because from my understanding, powdery mildew is just always there everywhere. Uh, once you have it, it's it's like, you know, it's just everywhere. So um, I wanted to try to tease it back out. And so I left it super humid um, and no airflow at all. 
and it never came back. Um, I took a clone of that and uh, I, I rooted the, I, I took the clone to my facility and I quarantined it in my facility and I grew that clone out. And then, and still I tried teasing it out and I never got the powdery mildew to come out. It just didn't, it didn't happen. So uh, I cloned that plant and, uh, and I started two mothers um, of, of this cultivar now. And I'm, I'm, I'm too nervous to flower, but it's, it's in with my other mothers. Um, I don't know, what are your thoughts about all that? I think maybe you got it. Okay. I, I, I will say that sometimes I see powdery mildew really coming to the fore when plants are drought stressed rather than mm. super humid. And oh. a powdery mildew is not one organism, it's multiple organisms. And you can have more than one species of powdery mildew, but many of them, and some of them have slightly different environments that they like. But in horticulture, out in your garden, you see powdery mildews on things like phlox. And I use this as an example because the years that it's really dry and the plants are drought stressed, the powdery mildew is crazy. And I have seen it the same in cannabis, that it's really drought stressed. So I think you probably got it, but I think if you, drought stress is the test. So if you okay. want to take one of those mothers and, and put it in a really low, low humidity room and dry it out a couple of times, and if you don't get powdery mildew then, I think you're probably pretty good. Okay, great advice. I'm going to do that. That's so interesting. Um, Okay, and uh, and then the last thing um, I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least just say once that um, uh, we, we do still have to get the product registration uh, pro process quicker. <laughs> um, it's uh, okay. I know I'm going to cut you off there, uh, Tito. Yeah. Um, this is not sorry. the time for complaining about product uh, registration. We have okay, such okay, an sorry. incredible, valuable resource here, and I don't want to. I don't. Gotcha. I don't want to waste any time on that. But there, I, I do I'm see one more question. I do see one more question in the chat um, from HMH. And um, so I'm just going to read that one. That HMH doesn't see BT spray on the list, Bacillus thuringiensis. And I am probably mispronouncing that. So if H, uh, yeah, HMH I, wants um, to type up, feel free. There's a bunch of bacilluses on the list. Um, I'm not sure if uh, thuringiensis is on the list, but that would be if that's something that you're. It's usually more of a caterpillar spray. Um, but um, you could definitely lobby for it, for sure. And what we do have is just Bacillus SPP. I think Theringensis would be fine. Because on our allowed list, we're saying Bacillus SPP, which means Bacillus, the genus, and all of the different species of um, Bacilluses, Theringensis, of which is one. So I think you should feel you, sh you should feel fine to use that product. Um, yeah, that that's uh, natural. Was that the uh, bacill uh, Bacillus thuringiensis? I used that for a bunch of years, and it does work really well. And uh, uh, natural, I think, is the brand there. Yep. Okay. So, are there any other questions? And if not, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna wrap it up because it is six o'clock. But um, I just wanted to say that if we take one thing away from this session, it should be that um, if we're not already insecticidal funguses or something, we should all go out and explore some more. Um, uh, I know Jessie I Lynn has Jesse oh. Lynn has her hand raised. Okay, Jesse Lynn, you're gonna sneak in before we close. Hi. <laughs> Hi, thank you. I tried to type it in there right at the last hour. Um, and I don't know if you're the right person for this question. I would think so. But so workers comp wise, is that needed only for employees, but not seasonal hires? So if you're just hiring, you know, a trimmer or someone to help you with harvest compared to an actual employee? I don't know the answer to that question. Yeah, let it. Um... I'm going to look into that, the workers comp requirements um, and get back to you, Jesse Lynn. I, unless there's anyone else on this call that knows the answer, I think Carrie's on, but. Um, 
I'm going to have to take a look at the rule and I'll, and I'll and I'll get back to you. Okay, thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you so much to Chris, our very own, um, and thanks to everybody who joined us tonight. Uh, I think this was this was a this was a great session. So, and if you if you have any other topics, cultivation topics, um, please reach out to whoever. Send them any any mailbox to any compliance agent. It would be really good to know um, what topics would be useful to you in the culture cultivation sphere. Yes, absolutely. All right. Have a great night, everybody. Thanks so much for joining.